Now I have in my hand the main sort of prop that we're going to use for a dramatization, a sketch of the uh, career of Benedict Arnold. This is an actual letter which has been loaned to us by the New York Historical Society and it is in beautiful condition. It's from a camp in New Jersey, February the 8th, 1779. My dearest life. It's to Miss Peggy Shipman and it's signed Benedict Arnold. A man whom George Washington appointed to a vital command when reliable men were very hard to come by. As you may know if you've read Washington's reports to Congress about the resentment, the bitterness, the desertions of his army. Probably the most explosive army in history. Now this is not a play. We're not going to use a lot of props. We're trusting to such letters as these which show the private thoughts of men at least. And everything that you hear General Washington and Benedict Arnold and Gates and all the others say were actually the words that they said or wrote. So, treason, 1780. General George Washington, the commander-in-chief of the newly formed Continental Army, issues an important order. Colonel Benedict Arnold, you have been entrusted to the command of the utmost consequence to the interest and liberty of America. Upon your conduct and courage, the safety and welfare of the whole continent may depend. Washington's plan is to capture the fortress city of Quebec, the strongest British base on this continent, known as the Gibraltar of America, militarily considered impregnable. For the attack to be successful, it must be a complete surprise. This is Arnold's mission. In about eight weeks, we completed a march of near 600 miles, not to be paralleled in history. The officers and men, having with fortitude and perseverance, hauled their bateaus up rapid streams, being obliged to wade near 180 miles, carry them on their shoulders near 40 miles over hills, swamps, and bogs almost impenetrable, to their knees in mire. Short of provisions, part of the detachments disheartened, gone back, famine staring us in the face, an enemy's country and uncertainty ahead. Notwithstanding all these obstacles, the officers and men inspired by the love of liberty in their country pushed on with fortitude superior to every obstacle. On December 31st, 1775, the attack on Quebec is made. I received the melancholy account of the unfortunate attack upon the city of Quebec and of your being wounded. I sincerely condole with you upon the occasion. It is not in the power of any man to command success. You have done more. You have deserved it. I have no thoughts of leaving this proud town until I have first conquered it. My wound has been exceedingly painful, but is now easy. I am in the way of duty and know no fear. The merit of this gentleman is certainly great, and I heartily wish that fortune may distinguish him as one of her favorites. Back in the 13 colonies, the news of Arnold's exploits makes him a great national hero. Congress promotes him to Brigadier General. But in Canada, his aide, Colonel James Wilkinson, notes an incident involving Canadian merchants. The General put into my hands sundry invoices. Goods were to be seized and conveyed to headquarters. I requested the general to excuse me from the execution of an order which appeared to me more mercantile than military. Because his troops are riddled with smallpox and suddenly faced by overwhelming British reinforcements, Arnold recommends retreat. He is not urged by fear for my personal safety. 
I am content to be the last man that quits this country and fall that my country may rise. But let us not all fall together. A retreat is ordered. When the American army retires, Arnold keeps back one boat and waits in front of the flaming fortress of St. John's until the British army is in sight. He makes good his boast to be the last American to leave Canada. In London, the news reaches Lord George Germain, Royal Secretary of State for the Colonies. I'm sorry Arnold escaped. I think he has shown himself to be the most enterprising man among the rebels. In America, the only thing saving the colonies are 10 miles of rapids behind the British lines. If the heavy British warships could get past the rapids to Lake Champlain, they could easily push to the Hudson and move down the Hudson to join the British Army moving up from New York City. They would meet at West Point to cut the newly declared nation in two. The prize is great. The British High Command suddenly decides to dismantle their battleships, transport them by land past the rapids, and start assembling them above Lake Champlain. To oppose the British battleships, the Americans start building a fleet from Greenwood. July 1776. Washington writes Arnold's immediate superior, General Horatio Gates. I'm glad to hear the vessels for the lake are going on with such industry. I trust neither courage nor activity will be wanting. If assigned to General Arnold, none will doubt of his exertions. General Arnold has nobly undertaken to command our fate upon the lake with infinite satisfaction. I have committed the whole of that department into his care, convinced that he will thereby add to that brilliant reputation that he has so justifiably acquired. Arnold, with desperate urgency, tries to whip his men into shape. He does not have enough powder to fire guns. To Gates. I beg that at least 100 seamen be sent to me as soon as possible. We have a wretched motley crew in the fleet. The Marines are the refuse of every regiment. And the seamen, few of them have ever been wet with salt water. When things are not to be had, even the kings of the earth must do without. I beg to be excused after the requisition so often made. If with 500 men half naked, I should not be able to beat the enemy with 7,000 men well clothed. I'm surprised at the strange economy or infatuation down below. A friend of Arnold's in Philadelphia takes time out from his duties in Congress to write Arnold a letter. My character is much injured by a report prevailing in Philadelphia of my having sequestered the goods seized in Montreal. I cannot but think it extremely cruel when I have sacrificed my ease, health, and a great part of my personal fortune to be calumniated as a robber and a thief. I have thoughts of going to Congress and asking leave to resign. Do you think they'll make me a major general? When the British battleships finally appear, Arnold's fleet is greatly outnumbered. But he handles it so brilliantly that the British, expecting no resistance and not being wished to draw on into a winter campaign, return to Canada. Arnold saves the country from being cut in half. February 1777. Congress promotes five officers, junior to Arnold, to Major General. There's no mention of Arnold. Washington to Congress. I am anxious to know whether General Arnold's non-promotion was owing to accident or design. Surely a more active, more spirited and sensible officer fills no department in the army. Not seeing him in the list of major generals has given me uneasiness. 
as it is not to be presumed that he will continue in the service under such a slight. To Arnold. I beg you will not take any hasty step, but allow no proper, proper time, time to, to remedy, remedy any, any error. error. My endeavors My to that end shall not be wanting. I am greatly obliged to Your Excellency for interesting himself on my behalf. Though, Though I sensibly, sensibly feel the ingratitude of my countrymen, every personal injury shall be buried in my zeal for my country. I shall cautiously avoid any hasty step. I know some villain has been busy slandering me. By heaven, I'll have justice. And I'm a villain if I see not a brave revenge for injured honor. Washington learns that Arnold has not been promoted merely because Connecticut already has too many major generals. I confess this a strange mode of reasoning, but the promotion which was due to your seniority was not overlooked for want of merit in you. I shall, I shall not presume to advise. Your own feelings must be your guide. Arnold waits six months. My commission was conferred, unsolicited, accepted with pleasure only as a means of serving my country. With equal pleasure, I resign it when I can no longer serve my country with honor. A person who, void of nice feelings of honor, will tamely condescend to give up his rights and hold a commission at the expense of his reputation, I hold as a disgrace to the army and unworthy of the glorious cause in which we are now engaged. He sends his resignation to Congress. Suddenly, the British advance on Albany. Again, bent on seizing the Hudson and cutting the nation in two. The most disagreeable consequences may be apprehended. I would take the liberty to suggest to Congress sending an able-spirited officer. If General Arnold has settled his affairs, I would recommend him. I am persuaded his presence and activity will animate the militia greatly. Arnold withdraws his resignation, joins the Northern Army, and leads the attack that wins the British position at Bemis Heights. This is the turning point of the American Revolution. Burgoyne is forced to surrender at Saratoga. But while the nation rejoices in his victory, Arnold lies in an Albany hospital, shot on the same leg which had been wounded at Quebec. A grateful Congress acts. Resolved that General Washington regulate the rank of Major General Arnold. His commander would certainly promote him at once. But no word comes from General Washington. Three weeks pass. A doctor. Last night I watched with the celebrated General Arnold. He is very impatient under his misfortunes and required my attention all night. Three weeks more pass. A surgeon. His peevishness would degrade the most capricious of the fair sex. <laughs> he abuses us for a set of ignorant pretenders and empirics. Eight weeks later, his promotion arrives. Washington's excuse for his delay. The situation of my papers and the want of blank commissions prevented me doing it before. At Valley Forge on May 30th, 1778, Major General Benedict Arnold takes the oath now required of all American officers. He is unable to stand without assistance. One leg is now three inches shorter than the other. I do acknowledge the United States of America to be free, independent, and sovereign states, and declare the people thereof owe no allegiance or obedience to George III, King of Great Britain. I do renounce, refuse, and abjure any allegiance or obedience to him. I swear that I will do the utmost in my power to support, maintain, and defend the United States against the said King George III. Washington seeking a post suitable for the crippled hero, makes him commandant of Philadelphia. 